Greetings, everyone. My name is Timothy Young, I'm an associate professor of pharmacy practice. I was invited to give a talk to you guys about um, what is the implications of AI in pharmacy practice. And I think this is a topic that you're going to hear a lot coming up, to be quite honest. Your students and you are entering a profession and a healthcare space that is rapidly changing. The pandemic did a number on us. It showed a lot of limitations on our workforce. It has demonstrated that we need significant help in many different ways. The industry as a whole is changing to keep up with rapid technological advances that are now occurring in society. I mean, let's just face facts. There's not enough healthcare practitioners out there Patient needs are increasing, cost is an issue, and inevitably what we're seeing is people are turning towards the use of te technology to address these limitations. My background is I've been regarded as a leading voice on technology and healthcare within the pharmacy space for the past decade. I go by the moniker, the digital apothecary. I have been talking about things like digital health and AI and healthcare and pharmacy for over a decade at this point. And the pandemic really was a big shift. We started really accepting terms like telehealth and such into a normal practice. We did a hard look at ourselves in terms of, well, how better can we use technology to help the issues that are coming up? How can we use technology to maximize patient outcomes and associated things? And I think for that reason, this is why your faculty has asked me to present on this topic, to give you guys some insights on things that are going on with us right now. So as we go ahead, our objectives for today is understand the foundational concepts of AI, its relevance in pharmacy education and pharma in practice, explore the utilization of AI in pharmacy, identify how AI will impact the pharmaceutical workforce in the coming decade. So it's going to be kind of a lot. I'm going to talk through like a narrative fashion, though, um, give you some insights in terms of what I'm seeing that's going on. Um, the reality of the situation is that for you and your faculty and for many of those in the pharmacy workforce, AI is like a new starting point for us. It's not something that there's really many experts um, in the pharmacy field about. Uh, how to use it, what's the best way to go about it can be confusing at times. It's very easy to be scared of this technology, I would say, than to really be accepting of it. And I think that's really going to be a big dividing factor. We're going to see people some that say, yeah, we need to go with this. And some who are saying, no, we need to put the Pandora's box shut again. I don't think that's the case. I don't think we can do that. So to start off first, like, what is the artificial, the artificial intelligence? We hear this term thrown around a lot. And to me, I always come back to it as AI as a machine's uh, ability to perform the cognitive functions we associate with human minds, such as perceiving, reasoning, learning, interacting with the environment, problem solving, and even exercising creativity. And I think about that because we want something to almost emulate us at the end of the day. Do we want something to go be beyond human capability? Maybe to a certain point, but do we want something that feels close to us? We want something that can emulate us. We want something that follows our same kind of thought processes. And that's why we've, you're, you'll hear terms like deep learning or neural networks and such have been developed. And what we're trying to do is basically create algorithms and teach some kind of pathway to follow a human's processy about thinking. And that's a lot of limitation when you give it to us at the end of the day, because how do humans process data? How do we take things that we experience and think logically through it and deal with it? From a child, does a child know what is hot? Does a child know that you shouldn't touch a stove? It learns through experience. Telling the child not to do it doesn't mean the child won't do it. It's at experience level. Taking this complex pattern recognition from images, text, sight, sound, and applying that to create insight and predictions on terms of what will be the outcome, especially from a human level understanding. And when we talk about like, you know, images, we want AI to learn how to interpret images, how we see it. And we have a spectrum of wavelengths that we can experience sight, for instance. We're not asking it to look at images beyond almost a human capability to a certain level um, on a day-to-day -day basis because that we want to emulate us take other animals in the, that exist, some have a wider spectrum than us, but we don't want it to emulate that because we want it to basically mimic us at the end of the day. And from this is where we're going and we're seeing this topic thrown around now called large language models or LLMs. And these are basically us really getting good at this and creating uh, algorithms that can recognize and summarize and translate you know, content out there in a way that we would perceive. So 
you know, if I ask someone to write something or think about something or make a song or music, we have a lot of things out there that we have rated good and bad. And based on that perception, AI can be trained to basically say, this is probably what is a high expectation, a moderate expectation, a low expectation for humans. And so this can help AI predict what it should do and what it should create. And I think that's a key thing. It's just like almost a predictive model in terms of what should you do and what's the outcome from that. And this is where we're getting to like generative AI or gen AI. Um, you know, it can basically from a prompt create something, whether that's images, text, sounds, music, etc. And that's basically because it has been taught and learned to predict what we want. And it's kind of a bias to that because who is driving that thought process in terms of what is good and what is bad? Sometimes that can be subjective. Sometimes that could be limited by cultural norms. Sometimes it could be limited by data and such that you can put in. There's an old adage from the 1960s and 70s, garbage in, garbage out. That's always been around in terms of mathematics and data. So what we struggle with is, you know, what is good and what is bad to put into these engines. And I think that's going to be the ramifications uh, for this decade as we see AI really come to the forefront is how do we think about that? ChatGPT is one tool that's likely that you guys have used and seen. I mean, it's from OpenAI. It's a company that's basically created uh, GPTs or generated pre-trained transformers architecture that basically runs this way. And their, their claim of fame is OpenAI has released uh, ChatGPT and that has upended a lot of things. I mean, your faculty and others, the biggest concern is, you know, how are you guys using this on the day-to-day -day work? And why are you using it? And who's going to use it for what outcome? Many of us are playing with it and we are playing with it because we see value in it. I think it comes down to what is the value associated with it? What is the value of any technology? It comes down to is that we turn a technology oftentimes to save time from monotonous tasks. Why do we have robots that can clean our homes? Because we don't want to do it. Why do we have washing machines? Why do we have other things around either to provide entertainment for us or ideally to save us time to use that time more wisely or better on different things that we find of value. So you don't want to go shopping. There's an app for that. You don't want to drive somewhere. There's an app for that. You don't want to do this. You don't want to schedule something. There's an app for that. And the value proposition has always been, well, it's a safe time. And AI is a tool that we're seeing that can do this, especially for this generative AI component is that it can make things that we would have spent a lot of time doing in the past. And there are some ramifications around that, because if you've had people caught up in between, they were saving you time doing human capital labor, does that thing get pushed away? And we'll come back to that at the very end in that, in that implication. But the, by and large, when we talk about technology and anything else, it's basically save us monotonous tasks that we can use for different uh, leverage of timing. Um, there's some concerns about this. I think for many the, the the funny part is that a lot of people thought AI would come in the form of like robotics and other things that we would replace those monotonous tasks. And we're finding it doesn't do a very good job of some of these things. And in comparison, we always thought that what made us human, what made us think, what made us create things like beauty and such, whether it's our ability to write, make art, music, or other things where it's like a safe thing, that that cognitive capability that separates humans from animals, et cetera, was beholden to us and AI could never capture it. And we're finding that actually now, maybe not the case. Um, we've seen things like this. If you haven't seen this image, this image actually was entered into a national art competition. One, it was it was using, I think, Dolly or generative AI platform. And when it came out that the submitter actually used AI for this to create a huge consternation in the environment being like, is this appropriate? Should we allow things like this to exist? Should we set up Threshold saying we have art for AI and we have art for humans. At what level is that fine and appropriate? What is not? And we know that AI can only get better as we plug in better data into it. So there's some current concerns around this stuff is, you know, what is good and what is bad? And what does it do for us as humans? And I think this is, comes back because, you know, we're pharmacists or we're going to be pharmacists, right? What implication does this have on healthcare? What you have in front of you is an image that's from not too long ago, but long ago for you. We used to have this thing called drugs, facts, and comparisons. It was updated monthly. So what we would do is before the era of, let's say, Lexicomp, Micromedics, Clem Farm, and such, 
if you were a pharmacy and you were operating, you had to have pharmacy and medical literature available at your hand tips. So when I ask you a question, you could look it up. But also when I ask you what was drug interactions, if you, before the era of a computer, tablets, smartphones, anything like that, or even an app, what we had was these things. This book was like this thick. And every month you would get a news, uh, a newsletter or basically an envelope sent to you that had forms that said, here's drug X and there's a new interaction on the market, rip out page Y and stick this page in now instead. And we gave this to pharmacy students, we gave this to interns and their whole responsibility was often update drug facts and comparisons that because it came down to that manual time for someone to update the literature manually because you couldn't Google this stuff. It was available. And this was like a rate limiting step. You didn't have up-to-date information. And I say that tongue in cheek up to date, but it's like, we didn't have everything readily available. It was very much lockstep in design. It took time for people to make this stuff, print it and send it out. And there are businesses designed around this stuff and we've gone digital, but the reality is that this is how things were at some point is our information medical literature was so um, short and not really fast. And this is how things were for decades. And we're in the past decade, though, we've seen this leap towards where we have everything at our fingertips and how to access it. If I pull up like a simple tool like Micromedics now that you're probably familiar with, I mean, Micromedics actually has, because it's teamed up to IBM at once time, a, it, and you can actually pull up there's a Micromedics Assistant, which is based off like a simple um, algorithm that you can like type in drug, uh, drug questions would give you an answer for it. So for instance, you could ask like, you know, what drug to use? It's not very good, but this is an example like five years ago we were trying to do. Like, you know, you could ask, you know, how much augmented should a six-year-old weighing 43 pounds get for an ear infection? You could type this into some large language models and it'll give you an answer now. But even our current tools still have some uh, catch up to do. On the right-hand side, you can see, was it dose augmented for a pediatric patient with otitis media? Then this thing pulls it out. So there's some differences in terms of how we go about that and how we approach these things. You need a very scientific approach on the right-hand side versus left-hand side being a very like population-based question with not a lot of scientific acumen that someone may ask, you know, it doesn't want to give an answer to. So versus if I use ChatGPT or Bard, it would, or some other tools out there, it may actually try answering that question. So in many ways, what we're seeing is this shift towards AI being regarded as a tool. Similar to how we had calculators come to market and going away from the slide rule and such. And we're just trying to figure out, you know, what are the implications for us? How does this change how we think about using these tools? And a large question is how do we use generative AI? What does this mean? For you as pharmacy students, this rapid applications of use within your coursework, your learning and such. Can you use ChatGPT as a tutor? Can you help with your homework? Can you help with improve your writing, for instance? These are all possible things. But how do we go beyond that? To me, one of the biggest things that I think that behooves us as educators is to help you guys understand that these tools will be integrated heavily with other devices that, and tools that you use in the future. Your pharmacy management system, whether you work at a chain independent or anything else, will likely have AI built into it within the next five years. Electronic health records, whether you think about CERN or Epic or anything else like that, will have AI built into it in the future. Our medical references and resources, whether it's Lexicomp from Walters Kluwer, up to date also from Walters Kluwer, some other things will have generated AI put into it. So we'll probably also get to a point where you go on PubMed instead of like using a Boolean search operating to find literature and parse through and seek about, you know, is this good or bad? You may, we may get to the point where we could just ask PubMed, hey, can you look up everything that deals with this, 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 and it pulls out for us. This is a future I think we're walking into. So one of the things I always come back down to Right now, and this may be outdated in the next 12 months for all I know, but one thing I come back is prompt engineering is really important for you if you're going to use these um, different large language models to accomplish a task. And what that comes down to is like, I'm going to pick on ChatGPT here, is like how long of a prompt and how direct of a prompt do you want to be? And I think the better you are making a prompt, the better of outcome you get with it. Some of these things I come back down to is like be specific in terms of what you're asking, providing context in terms of what you wanted to do, give references or example outputs you wanted to do and make for yourself. Experiment with length. Sometimes longer is better, but sometimes also shorter and direct can also do these things. Combine different prompts, iterate and refine them as needed. Understand the model limitations. I think this is one thing is that 
I always come back to what are these things designed around? They're designed to predict what we kind of want and what we want to see and what sounds about right. And the bias could come into it. And since the data sets that use may be limited, it may not always be up to date. And that will change as these things get better and are tied better with um, different literature comes into it. But be aware of model limitations. Ask open-ended questions and as needed, be mindful of the bias that will be in there. And this is where I think this is going to work, like a prompting framework I kind of look at as we think about how we use these tools. You know, first is outlining your output. Like, what do you want large language model to, or in this case, like ChatGPT? Um, what do you want it to do? What do you want to ask? What do you want to get out of it? There's some a large number of um, implications here. Some people will call these things large uh, learning models. They don't learn. You give feedback, and it just basically helps to predict what you want to hear next time. So it doesn't really learn necessarily currently right now. Going further with that, as you do this initial prompt, I think a guiding prompt usually helps like trace a conversation, like ask it to help you get from point A to point B. Um, I often think about like for myself when I work with it is that 3.5 is like a student and 4.0 is like a grad student in terms of what they can do with what you give them. But you have to be direct with instructions. Kind of think about like your professor and they ask you to do X. Do they give enough instructions for you to get to X? And what clarifying questions or prompts do you need to actually accomplish the goal? Um, for example, for me, like I might play with this thing saying, hey, create a course syllabus for me that blah, 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 blah. And that's some things I've done in the past. You know, some people have been trying to do this with like drug related questions, such as create a patient handout that goes through this or explain this concept at fifth graders reading level, for instance. And I think um, giving the examples that you've seen in the past from it to mimic has always been really useful for it because it can kind of like follow that example that you wanted to emulate. And then refining your prompt. It's not always going to give you what you want and you have to think about it and then you have to apply it. And, you know, for me, like if I'm making rubrics or other things, I say, can you turn this into a table that I can copy and paste and use it somewhere else? And is it good enough for what you want? And I think this is a big thing to evaluate the output. I'm going to come back down to this because I think one of the things that we're concerned about, and this comes back to you as students, is that how do we know what a large language model puts out is good? And I have to take this with a grain of salt because what is good is very subjective. But when we're talking about healthcare in particular, what is good is probably being the most scientifically sound. So for me, if I'm playing with ChatGPT or some other tools and I ask that question, I can pretty much immediately tell, hey, that seems like a right response or it doesn't seem a right response. And the reason why is because I have a decade's worth of clinical experience behind me. I know limitations to these platforms. I play with this technology a lot. I'm asking that things that are pretty, pretty much in my wheelhouse. So I can look at something and say, that, is a, that does not look right and that does look right. And that's expertise. So these tools are really good as a tool if you know what you're doing. If I gave someone who's never done math before a calculator and asked them to do calculus, they can't do it. If I give these large learning models to people who don't know the content as such, it may not work very well for them. So I ask of you, and this goes for other practicing pharmacists now, is as we see AI come out, we're going to have to rely on our expertise and our clinical knowledge and other experiences to say and into it, does this look good? Does this look bad? Does this make sense at the end of the day? The more experience you have will help you say, yes, it does. Versus if you're asking something you really don't know the answer to, it may predict what you want it to give, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be right at the end of the day. And these, I think, will cause some level of consternation. Will this technology get better? Yes, I believe so. Will it improve and we won't have this war as much? Yes. I don't know the time frame for that. Whether that's years, decades, who knows? But for this current time, it's almost like I look at it, it's like, you know, it's kind of like Google. We're back at that level. We talk about like Dr. Google. Now we talk about, now we're going to talk about like Dr. AI. You'll see those kind of things. You know, just because something shows up on the first page of Google doesn't mean it's the best references or best resource for you to actually utilize to get information. You still have to read and assess and apply the information, engage, is this from a repeatable resource and such? And I think AI is going to be the same level. You could ask it to do homework for you and write something, but it's still your responsibility at the day to look at and say, does this make sense? And I think that's going to be the key thing as we go forward and the expectation clinically that's going to be put on healthcare professionals. We will use AI to speed up our workflows and such. But how we use AI will be gauged by risk aversion. The more risky something is, the more it's going to be like, make sure you agree with it because you're going to be held accountable for the outcome associated with it. If there is 
and medical misadventure that happens, it's not like we're going to say AI was at fault. We're going to say whoever used the AI platform and went with it is still at fault. So it could be a medical medication dosing, it could be interchanges, it could be changes with dose uh, with other things like that, uh, recommendations to therapy. We may come to the point where we're going to use that technology for it, but if you blindly follow these things and you don't double check or do due diligence, then it will still be a human's fault and liable. And that's what we'll be taken to court over is what I think is going to end up happening. So how does technology impact pharmacy? I think this is a bigger question. You know, I wanted to talk about AI's current kind of situation, but I think the bigger question comes down to how do we envision this is going to change pharmacy practice? I have a feeling that but whatever we learn now within the next three, five years is going to change rapidly. How pharmacy is going to be practiced by the end of this decade is going to be very different than what it was even five, six years ago. Probably what we're seeing also across healthcare is the implication, let's start there, how we want to use AI and what we're testing right now. We're playing a lot with AI to work off EHR data. And the reason why is because EHR data has a lot of information in there. The value of large language models coming in actually looking is that they can actually look through a health note and actually build up a narrative format of what has changed and occurring with patients. Secondary with that, there's a lot of objective information in there, not just subjective, and that we can actually build risk models. So can we predict cardiovascular risk factors for a heart attack? You know, getting even further away than like an ASCVD calculation saying you may have a 9.6% chance of having an MI in 10 years versus no, we can get, because we have more population data, we can pull it in and say, we get more exact scientific metric out of this. Can we find more pertinent medical literature for specific patients faster? Can we translate material in different languages or to different um, levels for individual patients? You know, oh, you have college education, you have high school education, you had this reading level, oh, you were educated in this country, here's the best way to write it. How do we take account cultural norms? You know, like we talk about diet, for instance. Diet is all over the dang place, right? I mean, if you come from different backgrounds, you may have different carbs, proteins, saying things are acceptable. You may have an allergy to something and telling someone don't eat this or you can't eat this. They're like, well, I, I'm culturally limited. I can't do it. Or I have a restriction. I can't do this. Well, maybe AI can you know take that into account and push it out for a person. Can we automate documentation? Could we get to the point where you walk into a clinic, you sit down and maybe it's video and voice recorders are in the room and they can look at, your, at you visually and say, wow, you know, a week ago you were in here, or two weeks ago you were in here, and you look worse. You look more tired. Your voice sounds worse. You don't sound as good. Maybe we should assess you for depression at this current time. Or we started you on this medication, and six months later, since starting the medication uh, therapy was intervened, you do seem better. And get that feedback to the provider saying patient seems to improve or not improved. Um, we're seeing this for different triaging. In the realm of infectious diseases, sepsis is like one of those ones that has really done very well just because we have a lot of data points for that. We've kind of nailed it down to a science in terms of different scale metrics for who's going to do bad or good. And, you know, I think it's one of those things that we're seeing is like different diseases where we had a lot of objective information around. We can actually use AI to predict versus we didn't have a lot of objective data around. We're trying to actually refine that. Um, and medical imaging and such, we're using for like radiology, spot cancers and other things and do it faster than we could do in the past and having a person just sit in a room and scale through images. And that's what I mean, like medical imaging, like, you know, whether it could look for look at a mammogram, whether it look at a CAT scan, whether it could look at an ultrasound, you know, we're finding this has been very valuable. Uh, triaging, building to clinical decision support systems, trying to say, hey, this patient's going to likely have this kind, of, this kind of negative output in the next 24 hours. They may help you tell, like you have a unit of 12 people, which ones should you spend more time with? Which ones do you not need to spend as much time with? This is turning a medical rounding, turns into like, oh, the AI tool told us these patients are high risk and these patients are low risk. These are who we should focus on. Again, like that may be something that could occur. As it currently stands, the FDA has actually approved a large number of AI tools. There's now almost 200 uh, AI tools approved on the market in the United States. And some of them work through a device, some of them work on their own, some of them work as a clinical decision support system thing. They're all over there. Oncology is a big one, radiology going with it. We're also seeing, it's like you can see cardiology as well and emergency medicine. A lot of them are built based around imaging, but we're getting beyond that as well. I think in pharmacy, what we're seeing talked a lot about is AI will impact the spectrum of how we operate, whether it's pharmaceutical development. If you have dreams going to pharma, we're trying to actually use AI to discover new drugs. We're trying to use AI to run clinical trials, communicate with patients. Med safety aspect, 
is this drug going to cause any problems? You know, should we even take this drug into clinical trials because X, Y, Z could occur and it's going to be negated and not worth doing it? Do we find new uses for drugs that have been on the market that we didn't see before, for instance? Can we get to better levels of precision care? Can we take data, the omnics of data, not just like pharmacogenomics, but like other things like that, like your lifestyle choices, your physical capability. Think about the fact that you carry a smartphone around, you can track your physical activity. Can we actually bring that into that, your position? You have GPS and other things. Oh, the weather's bad here. More um, environmental impacts that could impact pulmonary conditions. You know, things like this we start bringing into. How does it support then our pharmacy services? How does it impact pharmacy operations? How do we bring in robotics and everything else? And I think as we add AI into this, that means our operations get better and frees up our time to do more things. And that's going to be something that we have to really address. I think a lot of pharmacy clinical tools are going to use AI in the EHR and the pharmacy management system, provide better clinical decision supports. You know, whether it's be like, hey, this patient needs an MTM. Oh, we just went through an entire portfolio for you. You don't have to ask anything. These are questions you need to ask or provide consult to the patient around MTM, medication therapy management. Oh, we already created a guide for you to actually reach out or a default package to send to the provider to sign off on, for instance. Does this stuff start doing prior authorizations for us, for instance? Uh, does it start helping us antimicrobial stewardship? Does it help us say, oh, you know, you don't have to spend your time going through EHR and saying, hey, switch this person from IV to PO. Oh, you don't have to spend time going to say renal dose adjustment because the AI tool does it. You just have to review it, click a button, and it goes through. I think this is where we're going to see a lot of this stuff come to practicality here in the near future. Here's a list of things that people are looking at. Can we track medication adherence? Can we do better with drug interactions, refill management, payments and billing, med reconciliation, prescription transfers, for instance, um, patient education screening, personalized medication management, wanting for average drug reactions for patients, triaging them, drug formula management, um, outdates, inventory, finding those cost drug, putting into it, prior authorizations. I think the sky's the limit. And I think I look at, I think I look at this, I come back to talking about like, you know, that simple vacuum cleaner. These are a lot of these things are like the paperwork. This is like the scut work in pharmacy that we don't like doing that takes up a lot of the time. Having to be on a phone to adjudicate a claim or talk to someone, can we turn into an AI platform that can just do it for us in the back end and we don't have to then touch it? If we don't like the outcome, maybe then we could choose to intervene. It may turn into like that kind of milestone where let AI handle all the grunt work, whatever it can't do. The human operator comes in, maybe be a technician before you bump it up to a pharmacist. Instead of everything going either technician, pharmacist, and having to handle all that manual work. We turn that lower level stuff over to AI. And that may be where pharmacy management systems build in and actually take it on for us. I think this is going to be what we'll see pushed by the end of the decade for a lot. Um, even data and how we handle data is going to be an issue in terms of how we know what's good and bad out there. There's no practitioner at this current time that can keep up with the medical literature. Even if you're a specialist in your area, for instance, if you're in cardiology, you know, there's 500 papers going to be published a day can't read them. There's no way. Even if you want to go to a tool like UpToDate, Dynamed, anything else like that to like keep yourself updated, you can, but you still have to scroll through all this stuff and read it. So we had too much literature and we're turning towards how do we use AI to handle stuff? And, you know, how do I, you know, treat our medical tools like a large language model? What happens if it's like ChatGPT plus Lexicon, for instance? So instead of saying, you know, you could just ask it, you know, I have, I have a patient that weighs this much, how much should I give into it? Or does it get built into the EHR? It just tells you, hey, I need to treat a community acquired pneumonia. And here's our cultures and sensitivities. Here's our antibiogram for the hospital. What's the best use? And bam, it gives you three drugs, gives you the doses, gives you the duration, creates a protocol for it, and you agree and you follow through with it. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, our responsibility would be, does it make sense? Yeah, you could check the CNS, you could check the antibiogram, you can check the dosing and such and just say, yeah, it looks about right. I clear and go on. And I think that's where, for you as students, it's gonna be the hard part. You're going to be bridging an era where we do everything analog and slightly digitalized. And then we're also going to launch into trusting these tools to operate for us. It's gonna to be tough. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. I think it's going to be a tough time. I think it's going to be a lot of like post-grad, wherever you end up, you're going to have to have more continued education in terms of like how to accept and what's used on job training to figure this stuff out. 
but I would expect that. It's going to happen to any pharmacist right now, but for you guys especially, you're going to be taught one way, but it could be outdated relatively quick. And maybe it's good or maybe it's bad because that means you can adjust quicker than someone who's been in the workforce for 20 years, has been doing it this way for 20 years, and then now suddenly has to trust something else. We've actually seen some evidence around this where even for like vancomycin dosing, we have AI tools that are built into clinical decision support systems that can give based on Bayesian math, you know, what is the best dose of Vanco to administer a patient. And we still have practitioners disagreeing with it, even though it's better than them, because they can't break out of that cycle. They can't trust. So that's going to be, I think, a defining metric for us going forward. I think this is going to change pharmacy. You know, I think we're trying to really approach and go towards engaging patients at home. How do we provide pharmacy services at home? We'll see a bigger push for mail order connected devices that track medication utilization at home. The technology out there is amazing. We are building in the ability to detect through Wi-Fi, LiDAR, and other things, people movements in the homes. We actually have papers out there that can tell if someone's opening a pill bottle and taking a medication. We're studying that. Um, those papers are in like nature and everything else. If you look into them, they're quite fascinating. Um, and I think some uh, businesses and pharmacy are looking like, how do I engage a patient home around pharmaceutical products or healthcare products or things like that to meet them where they're at as the home becomes a center of care. And I think this is where we're envisioning pharmacy clinical services go remote. The idea here is as AI takes on more of that scut labor that we can have more free time to do, how do we engage more with the patients on a personal level? How do we provide more services? Can we do like remote disease management systems? You know, can we do home health kind of projects? Then we get data from a patient saying, I took my medication at home. I have all this bio data, like wearable data, like take diabetes, for instance, CGM data, you know, how their insulin is going and or how their glucose levels are doing. You know, can we get the information saying, hey, you know, you're on metformin, this, and you're not a goal on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, what are you eating? How can we help you through that? And so we get more of this lifestyle, diet, health channel data. We help working with that along with the medications towards a desired outcome for that patient. And we have um, good data coming in, whether it's qualitative and quantitative on a real time that we can actually act on. And I think that's the reason you're here. I was talking about like, things like remote patient monitoring, remote therapeutic monitoring. We have different devices coming to the market. Again, that collect data, Bluetooth enabled blood pressure cuffs, uh, CGM, or glucose monitoring. We have inhalers that actually have sensors on them. So every time you do an actuation, you actually see someone use an inhaler. So someone has like asthma and they use their SABA or rescue inhaler ICS, you know, six times in the past six hours. Well, what's going on there? We should call them and figure out before they go into ER, for instance, right? You know, should we should try intervening and reduce cost and such and see if we can help them on the outpatient side. And I think this is something that people are looking at. We'll have pharmacists take that on for that disease optimization with medications. This is only be capable if we have AI that can parse through all this deck data and say, hey, this is a warning sign you need to intervene versus us just getting data and trying to figure it out on our own. And I think this is going to be because we're going to adopt a lot of automation. You're going to see a lot of pharmacies basically go like a, uh, what is it, a spoke model where you have like a central hub that sends, that fills chronic medications and sends them out to their, the spokes being their, uh, their pharmacies that can then dispense it to a patient or they're just directly mail order to a patient. Um, and that will awfully that will offload a lot of the labor at the pharmacies to prepare those chronic medications, dealing more with urgent needs, stat orders, or day-to-day -day, um, needed drugs or controlled substances. I think that's what you'll see. And as we do this, then the pharmacies themselves as a business have to then evolve, you know, providing other services with this time or their, their staff and facilities to fulfill the needs in the community. We saw some of this uptake during the pandemic with test to treat models. We saw it with vaccinations and such. And I think that's where you can see a lot of a pivot that's going to occur this decade. Well, what else can the pharmacy do besides just preparing chronic medications? Because automation will take down a lot of that. So how do we leverage our pharmacists better to maintain a good business? And, you know, it could be entering into these remote patient monitoring, remote therapeutic monitoring services. How the pharmacy take on outcomes with diseases or certain things, working with local networks, healthcare systems, ambulatory sites and such, and address basically these problems that the reality, a lot of uh, providers don't want to deal with right now because they're low level things. And I hate saying it's like low level, low acuity, but the reality is because we're so over encumbered as healthcare that at least if we can pass off to someone else that we can trust and do with it, you know, it's feasible. And then that technology helps us 
take on that time and frees us up to actually address it. So I think it's a combination of different pathways there and meeting. How do we make sure that meets and that we can actually deliver there? And I think it's going to be where we see current health change a lot. I think we're going to go from a lot of intermittent care, like see a provider, do something up. You go take the medications your own time, get these tests done. I'll see you in six months and we'll see how you're doing versus let's get continuous data, whether through the app, wearable, or some other kind of biomarker and saying, hey, this patient's doing good or this patient's not doing good. We need to intervene now. We can either do telehealth or some other kind of means of communication with the patient. But basically, how do we change this whole process of addressing care for this patient and doing timely interventions instead of waiting until problems arise? Because that's where the cost hit is for us, though. We don't want to wait. We want to be proactive. And I think it's moving towards continuous care models. That makes sense. You know, let's get to slide five, for instance. I mean, what happens if we get to the point where you know, you have a person wake up, they have a small toilet and they urinate it, toilet detects bacteria and thinks, hey, you know, I've seen this bacteria grow further. The patient may also be temperature is high, the smart toilet can sense it. Maybe it's a UTI, sends the data off to like an AI guided pathway that gives, that alerts the provider, hey, this person may have a UTI and what ends up happening is, oh yeah, they do. And initiate treatment. And what if the person has a home like a 3D printer for drugs and their smart home tells them, hey, you know, you may have a UTI. I printed out the exact dose for you of this medication. Take it. And the smart home helps tell you much your ambient temperature, your actions, to see if you're getting better. Maybe your smart fridge tells you drink more fluid. Here's soup for today. Here's a healthy diet for that. Or maybe other adjunctive care. And then your monitor remotely making sure you're improving, smart toilet, temperature, activity, et cetera, et cetera. And you have someone in the back end just monitoring and saying, yeah, they look like they got better. Oh, no, they didn't get better. Let's intervene, change the medication, or bring them in and talk to them in person. It's all just basically operates in the background. I mean, that sounds very sci-fi, but I'll go through step by step. The smart toilet, we're making this stuff. There are actually some smart toilets like this on the market, uh, surprisingly. So the FDA has actually cleared some smart toilets. Uh, the detection of bacteria... A lot of the stuff's already in research right now. The AI guided pathway for this does exist. We don't have 3D printing medications at home. There are some companies investigating it and everything else does exist in terms of like that telemedicine, telehealth, remote care pathway. So as the technology gets added on, how close are we to doing something like this? You know, what if you have a smart way to detect blood in your stool and say, hey, you know, you're on anticoagulant. Maybe you're on warfarin or DOAC. That's going to be a problem, right? Well, if I told you, like, eh, you may be pregnant, maybe electrolytes, and that's just a smart toilet. Now we start opening this to everything else out there. And this what I'm getting at is that this AI stuff is going to really change how we think about how healthcare is delivered. And as everyone else has to adjust to how we think about healthcare delivery, we have to think about how us as pharmacists fit into this. What is the business of pharmacy going to be in the future around all these different things? And I told you, I talked about, you know, what does it mean for upsetting labor and kind of human labor pools? We've gone through different industrial revolutions. First one was probably back in the 1840s with the rise of like threshing, I mean, of like the looms and such. We had people called the Luddites at one point that didn't like the fact that they had spent hundreds of years of making textiles by hand. And then we made industrial looms that could do it faster than them. And they lost all their jobs. We had a second industrial revolution with more industry. The third industrial revolution was a lot of technology. And that was not too long ago, but we can come back down to it. We had um, a typewriter pull. We had different things. We had, if you look at old offices, they had like a mail office in there to handle the fact of mail going out and internal mail. Well, email changed that dramatically. Instead of having to put a document in the manila folder and send it up to the ninth floor, have a carrier take it to them. Well, it's just email. Oh, we have PDFs that could do that. You think about other people like actually typing versus going through that. Think about like Excel. Excel destroyed a lot of jobs that were done by people doing by hand, manually basically putting together like just those tables. They could do calculations, they had all this stuff. And we saw that. And we're now at the fourth industrial revolution. Some people are thinking with AI and how it may upset some jobs. And I won't lie. This is some conversation in healthcare. There are some professions at high risk for being upset with that. Pharmacists have been documented as being one of those areas. And one of the reasons is because 
if pharmacy just focused purely on dispensing medications and automation could take on that a lot, that's going to hit us pretty hard. So the way I look at it is that the pure dispensing of medications, probably in the next 10 to 15 years, we'll see a huge decline of need of a, of a human pool to handle that on. Rather, we'll have to see pharmacists actually redevelop and use differently in the workforce, such as the things I just described. So for you who are entering the workforce, I think this is very key. You have to think about like where and what do I want to work on? What do I want to train? What do I want to know? How do I want to apply myself? Because healthcare is changing. A lot of stuff you're being taught now may be really outdated relatively quick. The way that we do operations may change very, very quickly just because cost, money, operations, better improvement for patients who have adopted a consumer mentality. They want things faster. They want things more convenient. How do we fulfill that niche? How do we take that on? And I think from a business perspective, we'll see a lot going towards remote care, having our techs take on new services, going more for precision medicine and not just talking about genetics, using the pharmacy as a health hub, trying to engage your patients more, really, really engaging in the online business model, I think will be a part of that really heavily. And I think that's going to change the pharmacy. We'll have different workflows. AI will identify a lot of things, patients to intervene on, how to direct staff, how to use them. The pharmacy team will see technicians overseeing a lot of dispensing with AI integration. The pharmacists will be focused more on clinical services. And that could be disease management that they'll use the technology in and use AI to help leverage and address low to moderate acuity conditions. At the end of the day, technology won't replace a pharmacist, but pharmacists who don't love technology will be outpaced. And I want you to think about that very carefully. How, keep up to date on this stuff. Work with it, use it, think about how to apply it. I think that's going to be very key to exist in this workforce for the next 20 years, going to see rampant changes. I think the more that we're inclined to accept technology and go with it to a professional extent and to an extent that makes sense will help us a lot. I think if we try to turn a blind eye to it, I think we'll get outpaced really quick. So that about wraps up my presentation to you all. I hope you find it enjoyable. I hope it allows you to think about a lot. Some things will happen quicker than others. Some things will be years out. But it's both an exciting and scary time, I would say, in healthcare because we're all at this starting point. We don't know what the end, you know, the finishing line is going to look like. We don't know where we're going to go. I think for us as pharmacists, we know that the dispensing role is probably going to change dramatically because of AI automation. How do we provide services? How do we find a position in society that still works around pharmaceuticals? Very, very, it's gonna be very, very key. And for you as students, keeping that in mind, thinking about how you wanna develop your careers, I think right now is something to take on and really think about. I thank you for listening and I thank you for your time. Um, with that, take care and have a good day.